Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about the family and education of Robert Louis Stevenson. Childhood and Youth Stevenson was born at 8 Howard Place, Edinburgh, Scotland, on 13th November, 1850, to Thomas Stevenson, 1818-1887, a leading lighthouse engineer, and his wife, Margaret Isabella, born Balfour, 1829-1897. He was christened Robert Louis Balfour Stevenson. At about age 18, he changed the spelling of Louis, L-E-W-I-S, to Louis, L-O-U-I-S, and he dropped Balfour in 1873. Lighthouse design was the family's profession. Thomas's father, Robert's grandfather, was the civil engineer Robert Stevenson, and Thomas's brothers, Robert's uncles, Alan and David, were in the same field. Thomas's maternal grandfather, Thomas Smith, had been in the same profession. However, Robert's mother's family were gentry, tracing their lineage back to Alexander Balfour, who had held the lands of Ickery and Fife in the 15th century. His mother's father, Louis Balfour, 1777-1860, was a minister of the Church of Scotland at nearby Collington, and her siblings included physician George William Balfour and marine engineer James Balfour. Stevenson spent the greater part of his boyhood holidays in his maternal grandfather's house. Now I often wonder what I inherited from this old minister, Stevenson wrote, I must suppose, indeed, that he was fond of preaching sermons, and so am I, though I never heard it maintained that either of us loved to hear them. Louis Balfour and his daughter both had weak chests, so they often needed to stay in warmer climates for their health. Stevenson inherited a tendency to coughs and fevers, exacerbated when the family moved to a damp, chilly house at 1 Iverlaith Terrace in 1851. The family moved again to the sunnier 17 Harriet Row when Stevenson was six years old, but the tendency to extreme sickness in winter remained with him until he was 11. Illness was a recurrent feature of his adult life and left him extraordinarily thin. Contemporaneous views were that he had tuberculosis, but more recent views are that it was bronchiotasis or even sarcoidosis. The family also summered in the spa town of Bridge of Allen in North Berwick and in Peebles for the sake of Stevenson's and his mother's health. Stevenson's cave in Bridge of Allen was reportedly the inspiration for the character Ben Gunn's cave dwelling in Stevenson's 1883 novel Treasure Island. Stevenson's parents are both devout Presbyterians, but the household was not strict in its adherence to Calvinist principles. His nurse, Alison Cunningham, known as Cummy, was more fervently religious. Her mix of Calvinism and folk beliefs were an early source of nightmares for the child, and he showed a precocious concern for religion. But she also cared for him tenderly in illness, reading to him from John Bunyan and the Bible as he lay sick in bed, and telling tales of the Coventers. Stevenson recalled this time of sickness in the land of counterpane, in a child's garden of verses, 1885, dedicating the book to his nurse. Stevenson was an only child, both strange-looking and eccentric, and he found it hard to fit in when he was sent to a nearby school at age six, a problem repeated at age 11 when he went on to the Edinburgh Academy at Collington. His frequent illnesses often kept him away from his first school, so he was taught for long stretches by private tutors. 
He was a late reader, learning at age seven or eight, but even before this, he dictated stories to his mother and nurse, and he compulsively wrote stories throughout his childhood. His father was proud of this interest. He had also written stories in his spare time until his own father found them and told him to give up such nonsense and mind your business. He paid for the printing of Robert's first publication at 16, entitled The Pentland Rising, a page of history, 1666. It was an account of the Coventers' Rebellion, which was published in 1866, the 200th anniversary of the event. Education In September 1857, when he was six years old, Stevenson went to Mr. Henderson's school in India Street, Edinburgh, but because of poor health, stayed only a few weeks and did not return until October 1859, aged eight. During his many absences, he was taught by private tutors. In October 1861, aged 10, he went to Edinburgh Academy, an independent school for boys, and stayed there sporadically for about 15 months. In the autumn of 1863, he spent one term at an English boarding school at Spring Grove in Isleworth in Middlesex, now an urban area of West London. In October 1864, following an improvement to his health, the 13-year-old was sent to Robert Thompson's private school in Frederick Street, Edinburgh, where he remained until he went to university. In November 1867, Stevenson entered the University of Edinburgh to study engineering. From the start, he showed no enthusiasm for his studies and devoted much energy to avoiding lectures. This time was more important for the friendships he made with the other students in the Speculative Society, an exclusive debating club, particularly with Charles Baxter, who had become Stevenson's financial agent, and with a professor, Fleming Jenkin, whose house-staged amateur drama in which Stevenson took part, and whose biography he would later write. Perhaps most important at this point in his life was a cousin, Robert Allen Mowbray Stevenson, known as Bob, a lively and light-hearted young man who, instead of the family profession, had chosen to study art. Each year during the holidays, Stevenson traveled to inspect the family's engineering works to Ann Struther and Wick in 1868, with his father on his official tour of Orkney and Shetland Island lighthouses in 1869, and for three weeks to the island of Air Raid in 1870. He enjoyed the travels more for the material they gave for his writing than for any engineering interest, the voyage with his father pleased him because a similar journey of Walter Scott with Robert Stevenson had provided the inspiration for Scott's 1822 novel, The Pirate. In April 1871, Stevenson notified his father of his decision to pursue a life of letters. Though the elder Stevenson was naturally disappointed. The surprise cannot have been great, and Stevenson's mother reported that he was wonderfully resigned to his son's choice. To provide some security, it was agreed that Stevenson should read law, again at Edinburgh University, and be called to the Scottish Bar. In his 1887 poetry collection, Underwoods, Stevenson muses on his having turned from the family profession. Say not of me that I weakly declined, the labors of my sires and fled to the sea, the towers we founded and the lamps we lit to play at home with paper like a child, but rather say in the afternoon of time a strenuous family dusted from its hands, the sand of granite and beholding far along the sounding coast its pyramids, and tall memorials catch the dying sun, smiled well content, and to this childish task around the fire addressed its evening hours. Rejection of Church Dogma In other respects, too, Stevenson was moving away from his upbringing. His dress became more bohemian. He already wore his hair long, but he now took to wearing a velveteen jacket, and rarely attended parties in conventional evening dress. Within the limits of a strict allowance, he visited cheap pubs and brothels. More significantly, he had come to reject Christianity and declared himself an atheist. In January 1873, when he was 22, his father came across the constitution of the LJR, Liberty, Justice, Reverence Club, of which Stevenson and his cousin Bob were members, which began, disregard everything our parents have taught us, Questioning his son about his beliefs, he discovered the truth. Stevenson no longer believed in God, and had grown tired of pretending to be something he was not. Am I to live my whole life as one falsehood? His father professed himself devastated. You've rendered my whole life a failure. His mother accounted the revelation, the heaviest affliction to befall her. 
Lord, what a pleasant thing it is, Stevenson wrote to his friend Charles Baxter, to have just damned the happiness of probably the only two people who care to damn about you in the world. Stevenson's rejection of the Presbyterian Church and Christian dogma, however, did not turn into lifelong atheism or agnosticism. On February 15, 1878, the 27-year-old wrote to his father and stated, Christianity is, among other things, a very wise, noble, and strange doctrine of life. You see, I speak of it as a doctrine of life and as a wisdom for this world. I have a good heart and believe in myself and my fellow men and the God who made us all. There's a fine text in the Bible. I don't know where to the effect that all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord. Strange as it may seem to you, everything has been, in one way or the other, bringing me nearer to what I think you would like me to be. Tis a strange world indeed, but there is a manifest God for those who care to look for him. Stevenson did not resume attending church in Scotland. However, he did teach Sunday school lessons in Samoa, and prayers he wrote in his final years were published posthumously. An Apology for Idlers Justifying his rejection of an established profession, in 1877, Stevenson offered an apology for idlers. A happy man or woman, he reasoned, is a better thing to find than a five-pound note. He or she is a radiating focus of goodwill and a practical demonstration of the great theorem of the livableness of life, so that if they cannot be happy in the handicap race of six-penny pieces, let them take their own by-road. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today, while we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite authors. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back next time when we answer more questions about one of your favorite authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the links for our show.